Good evening, uh, greetings in Christ Jesus, uh, CHBC family, and greetings uh, to all those who are tuning in. Uh, it's wonderful that you can jump on, and it's wonderful that we can have God's Word opened up uh, this evening. Uh, as is our custom in the school holiday break, uh, we break from our series, so uh, tonight we're not going to be continuing on in 1 Corinthians. We are going to be uh, jumping into Isaiah uh, chapter 42. Uh, I felt uh, compelled, uh, irresistibly drawn to Isaiah 42 this week. So uh, if you have your Bibles, please can you open up uh, God's Word to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah 42. And we will read only the first uh, nine verses. Verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. This is God's word. Let he who has ears to hear, hear the word of the Lord this evening. Please join me as we pray and ask for the Lord's blessing upon our time. Our Father, we approach you only in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to you by no other only him, and we thank you that we can open up your word. We thank you for this ancient text that we can consider tonight. I pray uh, that you would be incredibly gracious and help me to speak as I ought to speak, to proclaim your word as I ought with clarity and truth. And I pray for all who are hearing, Lord, that you would open up their hearts as you did for Lydia to receive the word and that we might be changed, that it might have a great impact upon us. I pray as we consider who this passage is speaking about, Lord, unveil your Son, unveil the truth about yourself. And God, may you show yourself glorious this evening. May you be lifted up. May no one get the glory apart from you, we pray. And apart from your Spirit, none of this can be accomplished, so we come dependent upon you. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is when crisis hits that our hope is put under the microscope. It is when troubles abound that our faith and hope is shown for what it really is. It's in hard times that people look for help. It's in hard times that people consider things and try things that perhaps they never would have tried or considered before. Some seek what is hopeless. Some have blind faith. Others put their faith and trust and seek help in things more reliable. But this all happens when crisis and calamity hits. You'd remember when uh, the events of 9-11 happened. It is said and reported that the churches were flooded with people. It's also reported that at the end of World War I, World War II, that there was a renewed revival interest in religion. And even in the 21st century, 
uh, with people unwell, where there's trauma and difficulties, when there's breakdowns, people flock to the psychologists and psychiatrists. People saying, I'm broken, fix me. I'm unhappy, help me. When crisis comes, people look for help. In Isaiah's day, there were the powerful leaders. There were the superpowers of the world that struck fear and terror into humanity. Isaiah mentions Cyrus, who would be raised up and who would literally sweep the earth. Kings would be subdued before Silas. And it even says that every gate of the cities will be unlocked to him. The people will not be able to withstand him. There would be fearful times and people would get desperate. And you see in Isaiah, the people's desperation leads them to turn to idols, to seek help in any kind of God, to participate in rituals, to seek treaties with other nations, to form alliances and pacts. Even God's people fell into that, into such idolatry. And yet in the midst of all that, you reach Isaiah 42 and God has a special announcement, a special announcement to make. So our first point uh, this evening that I want us to consider is behold what God will do. Behold what God will do. Look at verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Now, the context here is vitally important because Isaiah is writing to uh, either exiled Jews or the Jews who are just coming back from exile, who've just returned. Now, all of that, the the exile happened because of their idolatry, because they broke covenant with God. Now, we jump into chapter 42, but in chapter 41 really is the context of what's going on. And in chapter 41, God denounces idolaters and he denounces idols themselves. Now, there is this repeated phrase in chapter 41, and it's the word, behold, behold. Now, we don't really use the word, in modern English, we don't really use the word behold. A a more modern word that we use equivalent is the word look, see this, not really behold. But there is this repeated phrase, look at chapter 41 and verse 24. Chapter 41, just the previous chapter, verse 24, God addresses uh, idolaters. And it's the word in Hebrew, you don't see it in the NIV, but it says this, Behold, or look, you are less than nothing, and your works are utterly worthless. He who chooses you is detestable. Behold the idolaters and the idols. Look at them, they're detestable, they're worthless. And then jump down to verse 29. Same Hebrew word to start off. You don't see it in the NIV, but it's there. It is, behold, or look, they're all false. Their deeds amount to nothing. Their images are but wind and confusion. Now, we move into chapter 42. And Isaiah begins with the exact same word in the Hebrew. You don't see it in the NIV there. But it is the word behold or look, look. But this time, God doesn't want us to behold and look at the idols or look and consider idolaters. He doesn't want us to look there. He completely shifts the direction to something or someone else. Look at chapter 42, look at verse 1. In the Hebrew, behold my servant. So the shift is looking at the stupidity of idols and idolaters and their foolishness and draw your attention. I want you to look. Behold my servant. My servant. Now the key question is, Who is this servant of God? Who is this servant God wants us to look at? Now, the answer isn't as straightforward as we might naturally think. Because throughout Isaiah, this phrase, my servant, it's sprinkled throughout the book of Isaiah, and it has different references when it's used. For example, in Isaiah 20, verse 3, my servant refers to Isaiah himself. When you go to chapter 2, verse 20, my servant refers to Hezekiah's steward, faithful Eliakim. 
when you even get to the end of the chapter that we're in uh, tonight, the same chapter, chapter 42, verse 18 and 19, my servant refers to someone who is deaf and blind and rebellious. And it's referring to Israel there. So when we look at the beginning of chapter 42, when God says, Behold my servant, is it any of these three? Is it Isaiah? Is it Eliakim? Or is it Israel? Well, we're going to see uh, tonight, uh, as we work through the passage, the servant of God, this servant, particular service, servant, is the delight of God. He is endowed with the Spirit of God. He brings justice to the world, a light to the Gentiles. He opens the eyes of the blind. He delivers captives and he does not falter or become discouraged. Now, it can't be referring to Isaiah or like him. And it can hardly be a reference to Israel because they falter at every single point. They fail miserably as God's servant. So who in chapter 42 verse 1 is this servant that God wants us to look at? Well, let me quote an Australian writer and commentator. And he says this, quote, In short, The servant in this passage seems to be a figure who embodies all that Israel ought to be but is not. He is God's servant. Now, when you read the book of Isaiah, Israel is called God's vine. They were to bear fruit unto God and draw in the nations with their fruit. But they did the exact exact opposite. They didn't bear fruit and they didn't draw in the nations. And then... Years later, a man arrives on the scene and he has the audacity to say, I am the true vine. Everything that Israel was meant to be, a man, a servant, claims for himself and he's so much more. The servant is referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He was God's son. He wasn't a servant. He was not a servant. He was God's son. Sons are not servants. He's a son. And yet God's son became something that he was never before. He took on a new role. He became something he wasn't in eternity past. He became a servant. That's why we get that incredibly famous passage. Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Philippians 2. But even once he was on earth, Jesus was under no delusion concerning his role. What did he say? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And he even said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That is servant language. God in Isaiah 42 is prophesying of his coming servant. And look in, at the beginning of verse 1. My servant whom I uphold, literally whom I hold tightly. I'm going to keep this servant. He's not going to be like Israel. Now, when he says, I uphold him, we're going to see later on what he means by this phrase because phrase, God's going to flesh it out as we get towards verse 6. But look as verse 1 continues. My servant whom I uphold, my chosen one. My chosen one. He is handpicked by God. He is chosen by the all-wise God. Why does God draw attention to his choosing of the servant? Well, we have to ask the question, could anyone have done this job of being the servant? Were there many options for God to choose from? When we read Ezekiel chapter 22, God says, I look down from heaven. I look down at the priests and they'd all become corrupt. And then he says, I look down at my people and they all became defiled and corrupt. And look how God gives a verdict In chapter 22, verse 30, he says this, I looked for someone among them who would stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. 
That sums up the Old Testament. But the same problem we see in the New Testament, right? Romans chapter 3, verse 12, God says, All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Same dilemma in the Old Testament. I looked and there was no one. Get to the New Testament. There is no one. No one. They're all become defiled. So this is terrible news for humanity. There is none unless somehow God in infinite wisdom can choose one, can lay hold of one who can fulfill the mission of God. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, he understood this and he penned that great hymn. We used to sing it at the previous church I was at. A mighty fortress is our God. Now listen very carefully to the lyrics in the second stanza. Look what, look what he grasped. Let me quote the hymn. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Dost thou ask who it may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. The man of God's own choosing. It's Christ. It's Christ. And note God says, he's not only my chosen one, but God elaborates. Look in verse 1. My chosen one in whom I delight. Literally in the Hebrew, in whom my soul delights. See, the one that he, choo he chooses isn't just one who's capable to fulfill the mission. It's one whom the Father loves dearly and delights in. It's the one whom the Father delighted in for eternity past. God who is love, loved his Son before there ever was a world, before there were any creatures, before there were any angels, before there was anything, the Father loved His Son for all eternity, and the Son loved His Father. God, who is love, lived in love with His Son. And God, when He sends His Son, He would not bottle up this immense love that He had for His Son. And during Jesus' life, God did something unusual that he didn't normally do in the Old Testament. He spoke audibly from heaven. What was God bursting to say? What did he not bottle up? Say from heaven, this is my son whom I love, whom I am well pleased with. Listen to him. Not once, but twice God did it from heaven. We saw a couple of weeks ago at Jesus' baptism, God said this from heaven. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, God says it again. My beloved son who I'm well pleased with. Now as we read that, are we supposed to look at that verse and just read and think, wow, it's pretty amazing how much God loves his son. It's, it's, that's, a, that's a pretty special relationship they have there. Is that what God wants us to do as we read that verse? No, God wants to take hold of us and he wants to bring us into this and see, I think everything about my son. He is everything to me and God's inviting us to say, your opinion of him should be the same as mine. Do you delight in him? Does your soul delight in him also? If God is well pleased with him, so should we be. He wants us to behold his servant and delight in him. How else does the father show his love to the son? Look at the end of verse, uh, middle of verse 1 there. My chosen one whom, in whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him. Again, we saw this a couple of weeks ago. God pronounces his love from heaven at the baptism of Jesus, how much he loves his son from heaven. And then he sends his spirit to his son to rest upon his son. This is the gift of love from the father to the son. When, when God sends a spirit to his son, it is a gift and a demonstration of, of his love for his son. How do we know that? How do we know that the giving of the spirit is God's love for Christ and God's love for us? Well, look at Romans 5 verse 5. God says this, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit he's given to us. God shows his love to us. He pours it in our hearts by giving us of his spirit. 
And God shows his love to his son by sending his spirit to his son. It's his gift. And also the gift of the spirit to his son is to empower Christ for his mission. To empower the servant for the task that is laid before him. That the spirit of the Lord might rest upon him. Well, firstly, we have seen, behold, what God will do. And that is preparing a servant, sending a servant. Secondly, I want us to see tonight, behold, what the servant will not do. Behold, what the servant will not do. Now, in verses 2 to 4, we get this repeated phrase, he will not, he will not, he will not, some six times. He will not. Now, this isn't some incredible coincidence that just keeps happening. God is going out of his way to emphasize what his servant will not do. Will not do. So let's have a consideration of this. Look at verse 2. Read verse 2 with me. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. Now there's three kind of synonymous terms and phrases used here. He will not shout. He will not cry aloud. And he will not raise his voice in the streets. These are all synonymous terms here. What's it about? Well, it's emphasizing Jesus' gentleness. It's emphasizing his servant's meekness, his humility. When the servant comes, he will not come and arrive at places with pomp or a red carpet rolled out before him in each city. He will not arrive with trumpets or an army. He would, yes, rule the earth as we see in the rest of the passage, but he would be the opposite to every other conqueror who's ever lived, who ever ruled. He will be the opposite His ministry will not involve drawn swords and iron shields. You remember at the end of the servant's life when he's in Gethsemane and a mob approaches him, a mob with swords and clubs, it says. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, put away your sword. Put it away. That's not how his kingdom will work. He will not be like the conquerors and deliverers this earth has seen before. He will not shout, cry out, raise his voice in the streets. Look what else God says his servant will not do. Verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Now there's two uh, uses of imagery here. Firstly, we see that, that of bruised reeds. A bruised reed he will not break. So the imagery here is a reed, is that plant that grows beside the river, that thin plant that grows beside the river. And reeds are easily blown in the wind, easily blown in the wind. They are the opposite to the other tree that's emphasized in in the scriptures, the cedar tree, which is firm, it's immovable, it's steady, it's stirred. It cannot be moved. Now compare to the cedar tree a reed, and not just a reed, a bruised reed, a fractured reed. A bruised, damaged reed couldn't even stand upright. And, and the metaphor here is vivid. This is people, bruised reeds. These are people who are broken. These are people who are vulnerable and broken beyond repair because they live in a sinful world and because they've experienced the effects and consequences of their own sin and the sin of others. Bruised reeds. In, six, in Isaiah 61 verse 1, we get a hint again at this servant. God gives another prophecy of his servant and we get a hint of these bruised reeds that the servant of God will minister to. Isaiah 61 verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. These are the bruised reeds. Now, when we look in society, in major businesses, successful businesses, the people at the top, their job, what they do is they seek to identify weakness in the company. Who are the weak links in the company? And you get rid of them. You replace them. Or... 
in armies, military leaders and commanders. They seek to identify any weaknesses within the personnel and they're moved out of the way. They're dismissed. They looked over. They don't get the position, right? That's why all the training is for, all the tests are for. Well, the servant of God, he does not work that way. He doesn't throw out. He doesn't cast off the weak ones, the broken ones. He will not do that. He will not finish off the broken and shattered. Now, who were the bruised reeds that Jesus met with in his ministry? And how did he deal with them? Well, were there any more bruised than the lepers that he came in contact with? Physically bruised. Physically and spiritually and emotionally bruised. They were cast off. They were forbidden entrance. They were shut out and denied and mistreated. And what did the servant of God do? He touched them. He touched them. Scandalous. He touched them and he received them and he delivered them. He restored them. But perhaps the most bruised reed that Christ came in contact with amongst all of the bruised reed, reeds was that prostitute who came and interrupted his dinner, who fell at his feet, cried all over his feet, and dried his feet with her own hair. How did he deal with her? He reassured her of her forgiveness. She who was broken, humiliated, ruined by sin and others' sin. And he embraced her and he allowed his reputation to be tarnished by accepting her before all those religious elite. He will not break a bruised reed. The second imagery there you get, so he will not break the bruised reed. And it says, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. The imagery here is the wick in a candle or a, a lamp. Now, the imagery is of the oil running low, the fire is growing dim, or the wick is almost consumed through and no longer useful, and the fire that is burning, the light that is burning, is nearly extinguished. We get a great example of a smoldering wick in Psalm 73 with Asaph. He's so overcome by trials. He's so devastated by the trials God has brought him. And he's so envious of the wicked and how they keep prospering. And he's on the brink of walking away from God. Who were the smoldering wicks that Jesus ministered to? Well, one of the highlights is the thief on the cross. He started out ridiculing Christ ridiculing and just before he died he was convicted of his sin and he sought mercy and forgiveness and he believed in Christ the candle of his life was only a flicker away from being put out for good he was at death's doorstep and Christ didn't put him out but Christ assured him and promised that he would enter paradise with him that very day I don't know who is watching this evening but for you, you may, you may have spent the best years of your life away from Christ, trying every kind of vice under the sun. Your best years might be over. But can I assure you from the word of God, you are not too far gone to be received by Christ's mercy. You are not too far gone to be received and saved by Christ. You are not out of his reach. If you believe on him, he will save you. Who else are the smoldering wicks? These refer to the Christians who have drifted. Those whose love for Jesus grows colder every single day. Every single day, the will to resist and fight against sin diminishes every single day. And the love of the world has almost conquered the city of their heart completely and fully they are on the brink of being defeated who else are the smoldering wicks these are the christians who have been battered with trial after trial after trial after trial it is those who feel that even the slightest wind of bad news that could come around the corner that it would blow the castle of their life down in one shot even the slightest bad news one more trial and they're done for. They, they, they find no hope in even waking up the next day because they are so battered with trials. 
Who else are the smoldering wicks? They are Christians who feel that they are cut off from the communion and sweet fellowship of God. They, they, they feel that when they pray, there's no answer. When they draw near, there's no response from heaven. They open up the word to try and hear something from God, and he seems to be silent. Nothing resonates. They feel no assurance. They feel that he's not for them. They look back at when they were first converted, and they walk so closely with him. And now, they don't sense him at all. And they see no hope. They feel he is farther away. Can I encourage you? It says here, Christ, this servant of God, he will ensure that your lamp is not put out if you belong to him. He will ensure that your love will not completely be wiped out. He will rekindle the flame. He will replenish the oil in the lamp. He will. He will support the bruised reeds. He will make you stand. He will comfort you. And if you've strayed from him, because of sin and you've gone after other things. If you turn back to him tonight, if you come looking for him, you will not be met with angry countenance. He will embrace you because he will not crush and break a bruise reed. And he will not put out a flickering candle. He will not, a smoldering wick, he will not put out. And you who are weighed down, who are completely weighed down, who see no light, whatever your circumstances are, he will not crush you. Be assured of that. The astonishing thing is that he actually promises and invites you to receive a lighter load. What did he say in Matthew 11? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give rest for your souls, for I am gentle and humble in heart. He invites to give you a lighter load, you who can't stand. Notice the last thing that God said his servant will not do. Look at the beginning of verse 4. He will not falter or be discouraged. He will not falter or be discouraged. Why is this so extraordinary? Because God's servant will not do what you and I are so prone to doing. Faltering and being discouraged. You know, we all falter. We all become discouraged. We all become easily deterred. Whether it be in ministry, whether it be in our Christian calling, we receive criticisms or we don't achieve the results that are expected, or there are disappointments, we're unappreciated, you're unappreciated, you go unnoticed. My friend, what about what Christ faced? What about what the Lord Jesus faced? He who became flesh, he did not bring us up God's holy hill. God came down his holy hill to us, and the word who was full of grace and truth walked among us, he was the radiance of the glory of God. And yet, in John chapter 1, there is one of the most disturbing and painfully sad verses in all the Bible. What does it say? John chapter 1, verse 11. It says, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Humanity, this world, experienced the privilege of Eden again. God walking amongst us again. He walked among us, and when he arrives, humanity shows contempt for him. They have disdain for him. He comes as light, and humanity protests and riots against him and says, We love darkness. We love darkness. Crucify him. Crucify him. They protest against him. How is that for discouragement? How is that for discouragement? Christ comes and arrives at a, at a broken, at an ungrateful world. He comes, leaves heaven for an ungrateful world. And yet God says he will not falter and he will not become discouraged. How can that be? Who is this one of God's own choosing that he doesn't become discouraged or falter? There's a world of truth in that statement. He will not falter or be discouraged. Because in verse 3, it says people are bruised. People are like flames that are about to go out. People get discouraged. People are down and out. And yet it says he, he will not. He will not be put out. He will not be broken. He will not be discouraged like we are. And this reveals that the servant, if he won't be discouraged, if he will not falter, this is God showing us that the servant will enter into our trials and sorrows. 
He will participate in our suffering, in our difficulties. He will be tested. He will be opposed. He will be attacked. He will be harassed. He will be pressured on every side to compromise. He will. And yet he'll endure through all of it. He will stand. He will not be discouraged. He will not quit. He will endure. He will persevere because his food is to do the will of him who sent him. So he'll persevere through it all until he's finally able to utter the words, it is finished. He'll persevere till he can say those words. It is finished. You see, this phrase that God says, he will not falter or be discouraged, it is a subtle hint that the servant of God will face monumental trials and the greatest hill he'll face is Golgotha. That'll be the greatest hill and difficulty that he faces and he will persevere through it. There will be no escape plan and he will seal his testimony with his blood. For the joy set before him he will not falter or be discouraged. Let's look at our last point this evening. Behold the servant's success. Behold the servant's success. Look at the repeated phrase at the end of verse at the end of verse 1, verse 3, verse 4. Last line of verse 1. He will bring justice to the nations. Look at the end of verse 3. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. At, in the middle of verse, verse 4, he will not fall to be discouraged. He will establish justice on the earth. And in his law, the islands will put their hope. You see that repeated phrase, he will bring forth justice. Justice to the nations, establishing justice on the earth. He'll bring forth justice. What's God doing? He's giving us a glimpse at the final product of the servant's work. It is the glorious outcome. Now, at this point, there's no mention of how this is achieved. The process of bringing justice to every part of the world is not highlighted yet. All we get is a snapshot of the final outcome, a glorious outcome of success that the servant will have. Now, what is this justice referring to? Because it keeps saying he'll bring forth justice. Now, when we think of the term justice, we tend to have a fairly narrow meaning or view when it comes to that word. Now, when we think of justice, we think, you know, he, it's righting wrongs that have been done, or it is, you know, punishing the guilty, or it is recompensing deeds, whether good or evil. Now, that is all correct. But the word justice here in Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew, is mishpat. And that is an incredibly broad term. Even in the book of Isaiah, it's used in so many different ways. It's not narrow like we think. So in one instance, it refers to the right way God has ordered creation. In, uh, in another portion of Isaiah, it refer, the word justice here refers to Israel's relationship before God, their position before God. In another spot, it refers to God gathering all the nations together. And it refers to him bringing them into the seat of judgment. And through other parts, it refers to God bringing the knowledge of the truth to people, the truth about himself. Justice refers to truth. So it's an incredibly broad term. But what we need to understand is the task of the servant is mammoth. All of that he will encapsulate in his work. All of that he will bring justice to every part of the world. He'll bring the truth about God to every crevice of the earth. He will establish a government of justice in every part of the world. And that will be achieved all by one man, by one servant. This is an extraordinary mission. Well, let's just consider here two facets of this justice that the servant of God will establish. Let's just look at two facets of it as, we can, as we're in our last point here. Firstly, it refers to dealing with wrongs committed. It says here in our passage that he will bring forth justice, a repaying of evil. Now, in the book of Revelation, there is this striking and moving scene. Um, it's in Revelation chapter 6, and there's a conversation between martyred Christians and the Lord. Now, it happens in some period between now and the final judgment. 
There's this conversation happening between martyrs and the Lord. Let me read Revelation 6, 9 to 11. When the Lord opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them were given a a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Now, these these martyrs are crying out, when are you going to judge our murderers? When are you going to bring justice? When is it coming, God? Now, these words are coming from slaughtered, martyred Christians. These are coming from children who've been killed by people. These are coming from Christian men and women who've been slaughtered, those who were thrown to the wild animals in the Colosseum, those who were burnt alive, those who've been beheaded, those who've been shot through. What happens every year in history? It's these people here, and they're crying out to God, when are you going to avenge our blood? And notice, these cries, they're not sinful because the Lord doesn't rebuke them. He does not rebuke them. What does he do? He says to them, just wait a little longer. Just wait a little longer. Because justice is coming. Justice is coming. Now, it's not just referring here, this justice that the the servant's going to bring. It's not just referring to recompensing those who kill Christians. And it's not even just referring to those who do evil to Christians. It's referring to every kind of evil that's committed. It's referring to abortions. It's referring to murders, thefts. It's referring to evil of every kind, the atrocities in Kabul. It's referring to gossip and adultery. It's referring to all of these things. But remember... Remember, remember, it's not just referring to the big sins. What did Jesus himself say when he arrived? Luke chapter 12, verse 2. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you've said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you've whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. The time is coming where every sin will be repaid and brought to light. But notice how the justice will be administered. Look at verse 3, the very last line there. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. Now, this is really important because often when we cry out for justice, when we long for justice, it's not always faithful. It's not always according to truth. Sometimes when we cry for justice, it's based on emotion more than actual justice. God's servant will not deal justice like that. He will not be driven by emotion. He will do it faithfully. It will be done according to truth. And there's also an important phrase in the passage, he will establish justice on the earth. Now, this is incredibly significant. He will bring about just government across the entire earth. There will be just ruling and just leaders and a just government in every part of the earth. This has never happened in history. In all of history, this has never, ever happened. But it says the Messiah will bring this in. And this is a glimpse into Isaiah 65 where it says the Messiah will usher in the new heavens and the new earth where the servant of God reigns and Christians reign and rule and govern with him. Let me read Isaiah 65, 20. It says this, Never again will there be in the earth an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. What's God saying? There'll be no more abortions. There will be no more murders. There'll be no false trials. There'll be no more evils and tragedies because of injustice. It's all going to be done away. Everything will only be right always in every corner of the earth. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, what's the second facet of justice that he will bring to the nations? This refers to making known the truth about God to the world. The servant will make known the truth. What is true? This world is filled with Satan's lies. And he will bring God's truth to the world. The truth about God. 
Remember the context here. Isaiah has been prophesying about the wickedness of the nations. They follow idols. They pray to idols. They sacrifice to idols. The Gentiles are in darkness. And then in verse 6 we read, The servant will be a light for the Gentiles. You see, the nations, God says, they won't just arrive at the truth. They won't figure out the truth or stumble across the truth. My servant will bring them the truth. He will be the truth that comes to them, the very revelation of God. That's why he's called the Word, the Word of God. Hebrews 1, verse 1, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son. The ministry of the servant will go beyond Israel to the nations, and the servant will do that through his ambassadors through the Great Commission. And Christ will bring the truth to every part of the world. So what was once hidden from the nations, the Gentiles, will be brought to them. A light will come. Let me quote Alec Modia. He writes, quote, What had previously been the privilege of the few will become the possession of the earth. This is an extraordinary prophecy in Isaiah 42. And look how worldwide his success is. Look at verse 4 as it sums up. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. That word law there in the Hebrew is Torah. When we look at the word law, that doesn't simply mean the commands, the Ten Commandments. That word Torah means teaching in his instruction, in his message. The nations will hope and wait in his message. They will hope in his gospel. What's his gospel message? It's John 3, 16. That God sent him out of love so that all who believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. What is his message that the nations will put their hope in? What is it? What's his gospel? John 6, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. Do you see the servant of God? He becomes the tree of life to the nations, that whoever believes on him will live forever and have everlasting life, and the nations will hope in his gospel. Let me close. If you are a Christian, then the truth that the servant came to bring to every corner of the earth came to you. It came to you, and he won you over. And as the Father says, this is my servant in whom my soul delights, you also join with the Father and say, yes, he is the one also that my soul delights in. It's because of him. I started off our sermon saying that when crisis comes upon the world, when trials and difficulties come, where we look shows where our hope is in. What we give our attention to is what our hope is in. In times of crisis and trials that we're in now in the face of this world, God is saying to us, Behold my servant. Look at my servant. Let me close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. Lord, in it we find good news that we could never find in the newspaper. We could never find in headlines, in the media. We thank you, Lord, when there is so much going on and we are so easily deterred and distracted. We thank you that you turn our attention to your servant, your son. We thank you for that extraordinary mission that he took upon himself. He was the only one who could fulfill the mission And we're so grateful. We're thankful that he does not crush the weak. He does not put out those who are close to being extinguished. And we, who are so prone to be discouraged, to falter, to compromise, to to, to give way, to be deterred, he did not falter. And he was not discouraged. And he was able to endure to the end and say, it is finished. We thank you this has been done on our behalf. Oh God, help us to behold your servant and may we delight in him and you. 
May you work this in our heart. May he be glorified and exalted. And may he truly be. May the fulfillment of the prophecy come. May he be the hope of the nations. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope God's word has been a blessing to you. Lord willing, next week we will consider the remainder of Isaiah 42 as we look at the practicals of the servant's mission. May the Lord bless you this week.